And welcome everybody to the Computer Action Show, Season Uno, Episode Trace. My name is Brian, with me is Chris. Hey there, Brian. Well, hi, Chris. In this day in computer history, we're recording this a little early, so it's September 10th, in 1948, Charles Simonyoy? I'm sorry, I don't know the pronunciation. Simonil? He, well, possibly. Simon I didn't want to use the uh, it's pr- word. It's spelled it's Simon spelled like, with a Y-L yeah. at the end. So Simon Y-I and NyQuil put Y-I. together, Y-I. which really, um, Simon's one of the best video games ever, and NyQuil is one of the things that makes video games better. So the two together is pretty much amazing. <laughs> All right, so check this out. So what out. did he do? So he was born in, on September 10th, 1948, and he eventually became, not a, not right away, Brian, but he eventually became the chief ar- architect of Microsoft Word. He uh, really? moved to the United States from Hungary and went to the University of California, Berkeley. He took a job at the Xerox Park in Palo Alto. Nice. Where he worked on some of the very first WYSIWYG. You know, Brian, that's what you see is what you get. Word processing editors. Thank you for describing that. But they never me. really went anywhere. He later took that, went to Microsoft, not the actual code, but the concepts. He went to Microsoft and he integrated such theories into Microsoft Word and what was the precursor to Excel, Whoa. multi-plan. Dude, I haven't heard the phrase multi-plan in a long time. Yeah, so this is the guy, and um, that's, that's the guy. That was uh, well, a few years ago today in computer history. Thank you, Charles Simon Nyquil, to you, sir, for doing WYSIWYG work Nyquil. for Word and multi-plan. We appreciate it. There you it. have it. So we got a ton of stuff in the show today. I mean, all right. So you've got an epic it's, review. This of is haiku. this is gonna get this is get, gonna get kind of intense. I've got a Are lot you? of very strong opinions, yeah. and uh, honestly, it's gonna go all over the map. And I've got um, I'm gonna not, I'm not gonna go too far with this because there's only about a hundred million other people on the internet giving a review of this unit. But uh, I've got kind of a unique perspective on the new Verizon MiFi. Of course you do. And uh, I thought I'd talk about it briefly. And then, of course, at the end of the show, we're giving away a popcorn hour. That's right. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. That's right. But you know, Brian, all of that is possible thanks to, in large part, to our sponsorship with GoDaddy.com. That is an incredible point. This episode of Computer Action Show is sponsored by GoDaddy.com, the world's largest web host and domain registrar, which is the coolest word ever. It's like an, it's got rar at the end. It's awesome. Well, and it's got domain in front of which, it. Which, to start with, rar is like like lions, the noise they make, and it's a compression format. And you know what I like being? All at the same time. The master of a domain. A the domain. master of my and own domain. if you already, let's say, to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com has got you covered. Donate domain names as low as a dollar ninety nine. That's cheaper than a burger. Plus, world class hosting with unlimited disk space and bandwidth. Do it yourself website builders, dedicated servers, SSL certs, and so yes. much more. Plus, as a listener of the Computer Action That's Show, very enter show. promo code Linux. That's L I N U X and check out and save an additional ten percent. Off your entire order. I love that. And Some restrictions if may you, apply. If you feel See like site for details. Get your PC now. Go to dot com. Go Sorry, Brian. Continue. I didn't mean to walk I had to get, had to get the, the legal. You know, I've never heard you do way. that read before, so I didn't know you were done. Do you I like apologize. that? I apologize. I know. I picked a different one. Yeah. We've, we, what we do here is we have multiple different reads we could do for GoDaddy. I just wanted to say. But we never, we never We also have out. Linux 20 as a checkout code. Oh, that's a good one. If you use Linux 20, you save 20% off hosting. And, uh, and here's the oh, thing about that. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Hold on. Sh- <laughs> shut up for a second. Right, okay, go. So if you use Linux 20, it, and I want to clear this up because I got <laughs> a question a about this the last few <laughs> weeks. Uh, it's 20% off of hosting forever. If So, yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. not just like your first month, your setup fee. It's 20% off everything. That means if, if you got like some mega mammoth $100 hosting deal, that's you saving 20 bucks a month forever. You're welcome. There you go. I was going to say. It's just because we like you. On top of the MiFi review, I also am going to go a brief overview of the Jupyter Broadcasting Empire and how we do our server architecture, which a lot of it runs on GoDaddy servers through their hosting. Whoa. Plan. So that's how it's going to tie it. Whoa. That's pretty much giving you guys the keys to the All kingdom right, Brian, right we've there. Got, we've got too much show to get We got to get going. We got to do We got stuff. stuff. All right, Brian. Let's do the news. What's new in the news this week? All right, Brian. Well, the top story on the news docket for this week. I talked about it a little bit. I, I kind of had a rumor that I had uncovered and cu- and then was like, you know what? Putting this in the news docket, Brian. Oh, and really? And now that rumor has turned out to be true. And I'm actually um, pleasantly surprised. It's a little fancier than I originally thought. So today, as we're recording the Computer Action Show, Motorola has announced their new Android smartphone. And... 
Moral yep. is really getting behind Android here. So this is a really oh, dude, interesting they development. They really are. This is a great looking phone. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think is kind of particularly interesting about it is how they've tied in a lot of different social networking using their new interface they're laying on top of it called Blur. And it's Blur. The cute name is Moto Blur, but I'll just refer to it as Blur. Blur. And uh, it's it's blur. Uh, it's kind of a fancier, shinier dashboard where you have. Hey, Chris. Blur. Blur. It's blur. It's better than WebOS. It's better than WebOS or Weebos, um, which sounds a lot like Weebelos. So Blur is a kind of a fancy dashboard of widgets where you have all of your different social feeds and news feeds brought into one location. So it's a combination of Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, if you use all three of those. Yeah. Also RSS feeds, weather reports, all in one spot on your phone. So you, you turn on the screen, there's all of your latest social information. Now, some people, that's that would never work because if it only call, covers like two lines for, for me. For some people, this is true. That's But anyways, it's a cool idea and um, it's it's definitely very sharp looking and I like to see the kind of efforts going in this direction because it's one of the areas I think WebOS is kind of strong right now is that kind of social networking integration. So yeah, it's nice no, that's to bring true. that that's to true. Android. Yeah. It, it looks good. I mean, the screenshots look great. Yeah. I mean, so they re- it really does. The new phone is called the Motorola Click. That's C-L-I-Q. Yeah, that's hip. Yeah. It's hip because That's it how does, you know it's, they're hip. it's misspelled, so you know it's awesome. Here's the uh, here's the hard stats for the people that like to know the hardware. It's uh it's a 3G phone, so it's got a full 3G chipset. It's got a GPS in it, 5 megapixel camera, and uh, there's not an official word on Wi-Fi. Gizmodo says no Wi-Fi and Gadget says Wi-Fi. Now, I don't know Gizmodo went and actually had their hands on it and said, "Oh, we didn't see Wi-Fi." I think maybe in Gadget might have assumed Wi-Fi. But they also have their hands on it, so I'm not sure if it does have Wi-Fi at this point because yeah. it came out just a couple of hours ago as at the recording There's of this show. There's still a lot of questions, yet. yeah. Uh, it does have uh, address book synchronization with your social networking. So if you have friends, like I, asked, I have a surprising amount of friends on Facebook to put their phone number on their profile, and it can sync and pull that into your phone's yeah, phone Yeah, why book. do people do that? Well, if you think about it, you and I are kind of the exception. We have our profile set to public. Oh. But everybody else generally I guess has I, it I never even private. thought about making it private. Yeah, so, but that's... Because we come from kind of like a Twitter, oh. you know, a lot of people started at Facebook. We are public personas, Chris. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so I think it's I think it's interesting. Um, oh, this is also very cool. The caller ID when somebody calls in shows, of course, their phone number, but also their social network picture profile, like if they've updated it. So yep. you can automatically get the latest picture from their like Facebook page. Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, okay, so Jeremy's pointing out that... Uh, Dog 64 in the chat room said that um, on the Motorola development page, it does say it includes Wi-Fi. Well, that's so, very nice. I, so I do like Gizmodo screwed Wi-Fi. up. What are you doing, Gizmodo? Um, a few other things that they are They must have gotten distracted with all their uh, their Apple iPhone coverage that they did. <laughs> About posting over and over again. Like, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. Oh, right? my gosh. Did you guys Steve see Jobs, Steve Jobs? Right? He was walking on a stage, you guys. Oh, my you goodness. Guys, you guys, he did a he did walking. He did walking. And then they up, they updated iPod, Steve you guys. Steve Jobs ice cream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, was, so, there was... All right, hold on a second. We have to stop and talk about this. So... Um, there was literally probably 10,000 news stories across the internet about how Steve Jobs likes ice cream. That's because... I just don't care what sort of creamy, cold, fruity dessert... People want to know about his health. ...that Steve Jobs likes. People want to know about his health. No, I don't don't give a crap. I thought vegans couldn't have milk. If Bill Gates was like, you guys, I'm not feeling that good, and he comes out later on and um, is having, I don't know, let's say say a blackberry cobbler. Oh, Oh my gosh, you guys, Bill Gates eats... Oh, that does sound good, actually. But I just don't want to know. I don't want to know. Not only do I not care, I actually don't want to know because the moment you tell me what sort of desserty foods these special people eat, it's now stuck in my head. Brian, that is that is brain cells Brian. that I'll never get back. Brian, I'm stuck forever. I'm gonna die. That's lost and, capacity. And the last time I breathe, the thing that's gonna come out of my mouth is Steve Jobs like ice cream. Brian, but you care if I tell you, right? Like if I call you up and I say, Brian, I like ice cream. Well, yeah, I care if you like ice cream. Okay. But so I'm not a special person then? You're definitely not a special person. Oh. Okay. But it's cool that you like ice cream. Uh, so just a lot, just, to, just to wrap up this And phone, I'm going to leave that disc hanging Comes right in with there. built-in messaging to chat on the various social networks, actual instant messenger. Yeah. Um, it also takes 24 frames per second video, yep. which is very cool. That's and very it nice. comes with, uh, I guess, I, I, I would call it a D-pad, but what do you call like, you know, the, like the thumb pad for like video game I call it a D-pad. Okay. It comes with, I don't think that's what they called it, <laughs> but I don't remember what they called it. And it's a little, it's a little control They pad. really want people to make video games 
for this device. Of I don't know what do. the status though is as far as um, uh, 3D acceleration. So well, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. But you know what? What can you do? Yeah. So you, know, you know what this is really, really reminding me of? This is like the N900 from Nokia, except the Android version from Motorola. It's it's like you know what yeah, I mean. It's it's, it's kind of got though. A, it's got a similar form factor. You know, it's got the slide out sideways keyboard deal. So it's got the full qwerty thumb keyboard. Um, it's got you know it's pretty decent specs on it. Um, it's got a nice looking screen. It's not huge or anything, but it's decent looking. Um, and you know it, they basically took a, a Linux based kind of sort of OS yeah. and and extended it with their own look and feel. And that's kind of what you know Nokia did. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm kind of looking at this and saying you know what the the N900 is for. Uh, people who just like awesome, awesome phones. And this one is for people who, for some reason or other, decide they have to stick to Android. Yeah, I think... I don't know. That's I just how it feels like to me. I feel like over the last few months, there's been more energy around Android. But Well, of course yeah. there has. All right. So it's been, it's been brought up in the chat room, and this is a perfect time to cover it, is, uh, you know, there's starting to become more and more yeah. Android devices. One of them that's been covered is the HTC Hero. We've talked about it here on this show. It's looking like a great device. So we'll just do a really quick coverage. And I really think, you know, the Android Here's smartphone market is, is starting to actually produce some actually desirable phones. Yeah. And yeah, it is. Uh, and I, 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 mean, I know a lot of you like the G1. It's just not Chris. It's just not for Chris. It's not really for Brian. No, either. it's not fast enough. It's, it's too slow. pokey. It's pokey. It's too pokey. Uh, so, you know, looking at this guy, looking at the click versus the HTC Hero, which I think is probably one of the shiniest up and comers. Uh, they're both um, Android based. They both have UI customizations. The HTC Hero has more of a HTC touch, uh, touch flow, they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's more it's more HTC style. The click is going to be only on T-Mobile in the US, whereas the Hero is Sprint, but rumors are also it's going to be coming out for Verizon. Yep. We don't have a release date or price for the click yet. The HTC Hero 180 on October 11th. Wait, it's already out. Nice. Um, uh, of last year. No. No, this is 2009. Oh, 2011. Sorry. Oh, okay. Gotcha. No, no. Gotcha. October 11th of 2009. Sorry, sorry. I was, lo- I was looking at the dream over there. Yet. It's not October yet. Thank you. <laughs> God. <laughs> Doing a podcast, everybody. <laughs> so, Check information. They all, all right. have 520. Go. All the, uh, So, I'm looking at all of the current uh, Android devices. They all have a 528 the, megahertz. There are some different processors in there. But They're just different man- manufacturers which have different features. Right. A lot of these are integrated with a lot of other they stuff. They have the same screens, screen resolution and roughly the same size. It's I just, know. you know, I'm looking at that though. It's the same. It's, it's the 320 by 480 uh, and it's just, eh. I mean, that's nice and everything. It's just not great. Yeah. I mean, at that and point, you might as well just get an iPhone and live with the iPhone screen. I mean... I mean, which, I'm looking at like the N900, the and that's awesome. Do you remember? Uh, maybe the chat room could tell us: is, is the iPhone the uh, capacitive touchscreen, or is it the resistive? Uh, I think it's capacitive. I was at the Verizon store picking up my MiFi um, yesterday, and they had a crop of new Windows Mobile phones in the Verizon store, brand new. One, one I just put been on put on display yesterday, the day before I was there. All right, so the iPhone is capacitive. Yeah. So these Windows Mobile phones must have been resistive or something because. It was the absolute worst. No, it the it Windows was so yeah, bad the Windows I couldn't phones, go to web use use a different type of screen. I and, go and to a web page, you dude. end up you can't use really use your finger. You've got it for like the the the, the that's touch crazy, screen that's on it. You really have to use the stylus. Stylus is just old. I agree. Look at I agree. The, the web OS phone. Uh, Everything pre, is using capacitive the, the, screens. The, yeah, uh, I, I hear you. I hear you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying anything. I'm not going to come to the defense of the Windows Mobile touch screens. I was touch blown away here. about I'm just how saying. bad my user experience was on the Windows. It isn't mobile. great. It isn't great. There's no doubt. Okay. All right. So, anyways, I'll link yeah. to the HTC. Uh, I'm, I'm just sorry. saying that uh, you know these are out there, and I know that they're supposed to be like, what was it like 50 billion more Android-powered phones by the end of the year? But yeah. none of these beats the N900. That I mean, and it's by such a long shot. The N900 is faster, has a bigger, better screen, um, is just generally more powerful, has has a webcam and a, and a nice. The one camera. thing I think that Android has I going for it is the App Store. Well, but there's not that many apps for partially, it. Partially, I was gonna say that. It's been primarily a phone now for over a year. 
Yeah. Or is the N900 just kind of getting into that space? It's just kind of, so I, I hear you. You know, this is going to be, there's always seems to be like when, when something just enters that phone area, there's always yeah. gonna be something that needs to be tweaked. I, I oh, I'm sure. I'm sure when the N900, you know, has been, has been in people's hands for more than a couple of months, we'll be, we'll be hearing about updates to make it work better as a phone. I, I know yeah. that. Yeah. All right, Brian. Well, the next story on the news docket for this week, this is just so cool. It's kind of a hardware heavy oh, yeah. news docket, but, um, this is uh, one of the things that's really heating up right now, and it's the, 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 the truth. The fact of the matter is... is Bring me the truth. I want to hear the truth. It's off by Windows 7, and that is uh, NVIDIA and ATI, or AMD, are positioning themselves to try to bring out DirectX 11 hardware, and then they yeah. also do all the OpenGL updates and things like that. So ATI and uh, NVIDIA are neck and neck right now trying to get these products out, and ATI currently has the lead for DirectX 11 yeah. supported hardware. They're going to be out in the next month or so, theoretically. Uh, NVIDIA is probably going to be out around January-ish, they think. And one of the things that ATI is bragging about with their new DirectX 11 Radeons, which, and again, I, their DirectX 11 is, what, is how they're labeling them, but that also means they have all the latest OpenGL updates and all that right, kind of right. stuff. Right, uh, right. They are able to power six 30-inch displays at, on one card. Six? Six 30 inch displays, and it's um, it's six on using, one card. Uh, not using not using a, a, a um, DVI. It's using uh, something called which you've probably heard of before, DisplayPort. Really? Yeah, and uh, it's um, this is pretty cool display stuff. DisplayPort. So that's a total resolution of seven thousand six hundred and eighty huh. by three thousand two hundred, <laughs> which is the equivalent of twenty four point six megapixels. That's Here's ridiculous. the crazy part: I don't know how this is going to shake out under Linux or OS ten, but under Windows, it's presented as one single monitor to the operating system. So things like video games and whatnot don't have to be adapted to support the multiple screens because to them, they just are projecting to one huge screen. Really? So uh, at the uh, event where they were showing these off they had demos of left for dead and and a few other games playing <laughs> oh, that across looks cool uh, yeah across these uh, <gasps> oh, six 30 okay. inch that's monitors ridiculous. that's ridiculous over 24 million pixels um and and when these 30 inch monitors first shipped like you needed uh one video card with two dvi ports that yeah. would both be plugged into the monitor to be able to drive that right just for one of them yeah now, now you can pull six put six of them on there yeah. that's ridiculous that is absolutely ridiculous. So it's uh, it's looking pretty great, and of course, NVIDIA is working on something similar. But in, right now, NVIDIA's technology in, uh, requires modifications be made to the video game in order to support the playback. Where ATI kind of has the edge right now by presenting one single monitor. Lord, in anyways, heaven. I'll link to this. But I just thought this is such a cool thing, and it really is um, one of these things that I I, I truly believe that there's becoming this division. There's going to become embedded video or, or low end and like the NVIDIA ION where it's, it comes essentially uh, as a embedded video chipset, but it's still technically discrete, but it's fairly low powered. Then you're going to have these yeah, massively yeah. high end systems. And that's why it's so critical that everybody has really great driver support for all this stuff because these video oh, cards sure. are going to be used for more and more general purpose tasks like encoding and all this kind of different uh, live updating of content when you bring in a CD, you know, even MP3 encoding and AUG encoding well, is going to be done on let's this be, Let's be realistic about it. We're, we're probably, you know, a little bit more uh, in need of this sort of thing than the average person at the current time because we do all the, all the video encoding and all the live encoding and streaming and everything like that. I mean, how much really is the average Joe going to need this stuff? You know, at least for quite a while. I mean, even currently they can do, you know, live encoding of video for, well, for their mean, own home movies and stuff, even with current gen well, hardware. They don't need this. They don't need the, the six screen thing. I mean, as much no, as I six screen thing they, they don't need the six screen thing but the but massive power behind it i mean the uh like right you can now buy like a you can buy I'll like an, an 80 dollar video card right now that you can play like world of warcraft oh, sure, or whatever sure. game well, totally yeah, maxed out so i mean what here's the thing i know we gotta push Brian, it but come here's on. the thing come on so uh earlier in the week chris are you gonna keep it real i'm gonna tell you about it i don't know I'm, if you're gonna Brian, keep it real I'm, sir i'm about to tell jeremy, you jeremy is chris gonna keep it real right now Jeremy has confidence in you. You may go. Uh, all right, here we go. So the thing, the thing that's kind of uh, something to consider is, like, you look at um, an iPod or uh, the Zune when you uh, bring on a, a video file to the Zune or the iPod or some other devices through iTunes or the Zune Play or whatever it's called. Um, it'll do transcoding so that way it supports the device. The user doesn't have to worry about if it's a. H.264 and an MP4 container uh, with uh, AAC audio. They don't. They don't have to worry about any of that yeah. because the software will transcode it. Now, 
on slower systems, that means it takes hours to sync. That's true. With this, with these real time accelerations through video cards, you're you're looking at such a phenomenal improvement in time. Snow Leopard and uh, Windows Seven already have built in. Uh, facilities to take advantage of this. There's very active work under Linux for from both a, uh, AMD and NVIDIA to enable that kind of um, functionality. So I think, you know, you're not going to have to have, a, I'm not saying you have to have a high-end graphics card, oh, but I think, oh, I, have I, to have one. I think for the people that <laughs> will saying. have one, I, well, I think for the folks that will have one, there's going to be an obvious benefit there. Now I'm obviously, um, you know, because we do, we do video production yeah. and stuff like that. I'm, I'm biased, but I do believe that, you know, I was just looking at, I was gonna say this earlier. You know, earlier in the week, uh, the uh, the whatever the mm, group is behind the cable card standard uh, is re- is removing the restrictions where you have to have oh, uh, yeah. a cable card. Like, if you want a PC with a cable card, it can only be an OEM. It has to be shipped from an OEM like Dell or somebody else. And they're removing that restriction now. Well, that is very great because you know, That's awesome. get a cable card system from your cable provider. You can bring TV right into a Myth TV box. You know, eventually or anything. Yeah. And um, one of the things that um, Myth TV does today to kind of get around the lack of underpowered hardware is uh, it'll record TV in very, very, very large MPEG files. Right. Because it's not a ton of CPU to get that uh, in that in that compression. And then you can schedule it after hours when you're not watching TV to re-encode it. And then also one of the things I love about Myth TV is you can also mm-hmm. have it remove commercials mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Now, what if though through these video cards, and I'm not Ready. talking crazy stuff, but what if through these video cards, it could just record directly into that destination format? It would be nice. So then you're not I, going I, from one I lossy format nice. to another lossy format because the problem is by, by going from MPEG to say, um, you know, whatever you want to go to, uh, H.264, WMV, your, right, right. You you're going from a lossy format to, to another lossy. lossy so you're, it's, you're it's losing. best to just encode and make it go straight there. You got it. Boom. And that's uh, a kablamo But moment. the hardware, for the most part, now with some core i with core i seven processors, you can generally do it. But you're, those things put yeah. off a ton of heat when they're when they're working like that. So I really think there's some 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 potential there that we don't even. It's like I never <laughs> thought of. I never thought of live streaming a podcast via video before DSL was around. That's true. You know, when I was on dial-up, yeah. I mean, that, that concept... That sounded crazy. That concept never it even did. entered my head. It sounded crazy. And then once, once the bandwidth became there, like, things grew. Like, you see things, you know, yeah, online videos going. So I think, on. once, I think once the hardware bandwidth is there, these kinds of things and, will grow. I think hey, interfaces I, will become... I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we don't need more GPU. I'm just saying six friggin' monitors, and those are big friggin' oh, no, monitors. No, 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 yeah, Come no. on. That's no, ridiculous. I have no interest in the, that. Like, the only use for that, really, is for someone who just demands a wall of monitors, or for, like, a display display it like a like a store or something just to show off yeah like a trade show but yeah uh, no i do not think uh, a wall of monitors is important but i do like the idea of of a of a, of a, a good of a good system with maybe two three at the most nice big monitors because yeah, it, it. it comes a point we have six that's too much to look at and you will immediately irradiate your brain well and it's just so much power i mean yeah it's ridiculous I, you know i i just don't know at what point it's excessive, but I do know that six is definitely beyond that point. <laughs> six is definitely um, unnecessary. All right. But it, it's interesting because it does display the uh, advantage of DisplayPort. DisplayPort yeah. is able to scale at hi- much higher yeah. resolutions, and DisplayPort is an open standard. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know about uh, open as in. All right. I'm just getting, I'm just saying. Excuse I'm, me while I chew on my breath. For I, a minute I'm just that saying statement. that DisplayPort has some advantages, and I'm ready. I, I, I'm ready. You do want those advantages. I'm not, I'm not denying that. All, All right. right. Do we have any other news? By All any right. Chance? Okay. Other than the fact that we can have six monitors at once. Here's the kind of last gear Chris. thing I have for the show. Well, maybe one of the last. <laughs> uh, I just thought this was really cool. So do you remember iOmega, the, zip, the makers of the zip drive like and the, the gear jazz drive? action show. Hmm? Do you remember the I- iOmega, the makers of like the zip drive oh, and the dude, jazz drive? I loved my jazz drive. Right. This was so I back. I had a jazz drive. Everyone, everyone knows about the was, zip drive. Was it one gig or was it two gigs? It was one gig. Yeah. Okay. One gig for the jazz drive and a hundred megs for the zip drive. You know, everyone, yeah. every school. Has had like a zip drive. They were slow and they were prone to failure, but it was cool because it was a it was a hundred megs. Like a death came from, and it was awesome. The jazz drives was a gig, 
and it was fairly cheap at the time. It cost like like 60, 70 bucks. You were only rocking that thing on SCSI too, right? Yeah, it was only over yeah. SCSI. I had it, I had plugged in over SCSI and my internal hard drive was 540 yeah, megs. Yeah, yeah, same. My jazz drive was a gig. Yep. It wasn't crazy fast, but it wasn't much slower than my hard drive. So everything ran off of my jazz drive. Just everything. Sure, why not? And I only had a couple of discs for it, but man, was it great. All right, Brian. So the next story on the news docket is Iomega. I just flashed all the way back to the mid 90s. Yeah. It was awesome. I went with that you. Whole, that whole it was a trip good ride. I just took. I, I wish you guys could have come with me because it was awesome. My little 486, Nostalgia. little SX33 I had rocking there. Oh man, that did was you good ever times. use any of those parallel port based Iomega devices? They're I, always a pain in the butt. I did. I did for the zip drive. I used yeah. the parallel port version. I had. Of zip drive. I had SCSI and I had parallel, and yeah. the parallel was substantially slower. Oh lord, the parallel crazy. port versions were awesome. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was. It was. Uh, I was able to boot, you know, a machine and, and reload Windows ninety five or something. I don't remember what I was yeah, doing. Yeah, Windows ninety five A when that first came out. Oh yeah. lord. All right, so Iomega has announced. Which, All of a sudden, the mid nineties just turned evil know, in my mind. Uh, <laughs> like Iomega, I was loving it until you. Who did that? Did you know Iomega was bought by EMC? I had no idea. Yeah, EMC is like a big player in the yeah, enterprise yeah, storage market. for sure. Uh, so Iomega has announced the store center IX 4-200D. You know, see how that's catchy? Just rolls right off the tongue. Wow, that's, that's a good name for this a This sucker is uh, it's a SAN, uh, well, it's a NAS, network attached storage, and it comes in two, four, and eight terabyte versions. Okay. Now, if you buy a two terabyte, you can always add drives. Yeah. Um, eight, eight terabytes is probably the one we want to talk about because that's baller. Sure, how much? And uh, it comes in at $1,900 for eight terabytes. What? Now, though, here's what, what you get. No, wait, no, hold on. Buckle up, <laughs> At sir. this point, I don't even care what you get. $1,900 for eight terabytes? Dude, check this out, I though. I can put that together for like 700 bucks. Check this out. What do I care? All right. Is so, it going to give me like $1,200 worth of stuff? It's it's a network attached storage with two gigabit ports, right? Okay. Okay. I, I can do that for an extra 20 yes, bucks. I know. I know. It uh, will work as an Apple time machine device. Okay. I'm playing with you. I'm oh, playing with you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it works as ice and ice guzzy target. Okay. I can actually use that. So, and it also works as a VMware, though. a certified VMware storage device. Now, hold on. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean a certified VMware storage device? So if you run a uh, enterprise grade VMware product okay, and you sure. want to attach to an ice guzzy device, you can go the unsupported route and connect to just any general iSCSI device or VMware has a very specific set of products that they'll support. I just and uh, there's like no other product in the market that starts below seven hundred dollars as VMware certification. So that's but that's but this it. thing is too grand. All right. Hold up. Hold up. Here's what it, here's what you go. All right. So obviously All hot, right, I'm ready for obviously it. the drives there's there's SATA two drives are hot swappable. Um, it's got three USB ports, but hold on. Hold on. It uh, it has it supports multiple levels of RAID, including five, ten, JBOD, all kinds of different stuff. It has uh, built-in encryption on the drive, so the device can be encrypted. So somebody came in and walked away with it. All your data is encrypted. So it like has, something you could do with oh Linux, Windows, yes, any other server OS. It has device to device. Um, replication where you can oh. if you have two of them they'll, they'll be able to sync to each like other. Like Linux or Windows, got it. But see the thing is is you would have to set all that up. Um, now you see this probably isn't or buy it from someone who's pre set up for less than Active two grand. Directory support. Why do I care about Active <laughs> Directory support? SNMP support? Why do I <sighs> Uh, All right, man. I, you're just yanking my chain now because this just sounds stupid. The two terabyte version is seven hundred dollars, and you could always throw more drives in that. Okay, that's so great. you get all of that stuff plus right. two terabytes for seven hundred dollars. I don't know. Two terabytes for seven hundred doesn't sound so bad, but six terabytes of extra well, storage for twelve hundred dollars. You could buy a two. You can buy actually a terabyte and a half. A uh, nice Barracuda hard drive you can get for like ninety bucks on sale. I was going to say your, your buddies over at Western Digital are now shipping a two terabyte drive for like two two fifty. I mean, I'm not going to buy a Western Digital two terabyte drive, but I, I mean a Seagate Barracuda though. I'll take that. Like you know what sucks is Western Digital is making really great drives now. Are they really? I hate that. They used they were making they terrible drives. They have got this thing now, so they've got this thing. So you know you know how the uh, you know how the the head goes over the hard drive platter and the and the head goes back and forth as it yeah. sits for data, right? Yeah. So that stills in place, and they they have magnets all along the bottom of that, so we can read anything in that whole path. And that's right, over. And the whole stripe. But no, now also, strip, now whatever. also, the tip of the actuator has an actuator, and so that can seek too. So it can move independently of the whole arm. Oh, interesting. The uh, the uh, 7200, 7200 RPM drives and early benchmarks are coming in faster than like the high performance drives. Like just really, the, yeah. The, at least the Caviar Black editions, because that little extra seek thing cuts down like. If it just has to move a little bit instead of having to move the whole arm, it just 
It's it's very cool. Oh, that's very slick. Yeah, so, so that that is very very but cool. For, but that's just a single drive and doesn't have any of the NAS capabilities. This is basically you plug it in and it does every network protocol known to man. Oh, you mean um, kind of like Linux or Windows servers? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so can. okay, so why is this news? Well. Because it's all I don't mean to dog on your news here because you had me with all these other items up until Mr. I Omega by EMC well, see, here's presents an overpriced storage box. I mean, I can go to Newegg and get like five different ones what, what that you are gotta, almost what you identical. Gotta Brian, is I mean, Buffalo has a couple that are that are similar for like half the cost. So what do I want this for? Brian, what you're not appreciating is um, oh, the other thing that's kind of cool is it's well, just going to do the click of death and I'm going to have no, to get rid of it anyway. The thing you're not see. Okay, think about it. Like, if you have a client who has, uh, say, they have ten workstations, they don't want to okay. buy a full, a whole end server, a high end server. They just want file storage. Okay, so what? You drop this guy in. You've got. But I could do that with any of the various uh, all in one boxes, like the Buffalo, like the Buffalo Terra stations are are cheaper and have just as many features. Yes, and just but I'll let me tell you a little story. Um, Monday or Tuesday, one of the guys, one of one of the guys I work with, went in to respond to an issue at a client, and uh-huh. the Buffalo Terra station lost the entire raid set great let me tell you another story uh i omega zip drives it's emc now and emc is a big name in store huh, it says i omega right on the front there hey, you know, with a little logo that was you on, know what, on the you front know of the click drives uh, that the click drives the zip drives as they were clicking you away know what going, else? brian chick, 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 chick. you know what else emc makes that you like what do they make that i VMware. like vmware emc owns vmware they do yeah they don't yeah they, they they didn't make it but they do now i mean they own vmware Really? So, prove my point. Ha ha, I win. All right, move on to the next one. <laughs> All right, Brian, the we'll next story this out later. on the news docket. It's just a quick one. I'm just going to make a quick mention of it. Tom well, this Tom. This is kind of cool. Because remember Tom Tom? They just had the uh, patent lawsuits with oh, Microsoft. Yeah, those they guys. Settled on. Yeah, I forgot they about that them. They make that Linux-based navigation system, and they have just announced the OpenLR navigation project. Now, there is already an Open Maps project out there, and Floss Weekly just did an interview with the guys like two or three episodes ago. So if nice. you're curious about that, check that out. But OpenLR is essentially their version of user-corrected maps that will be distributed through the TomTom navigation units, and you can download these updates and things like that to your device. Yeah, Yeah, it's really cool. I dig it. And the reason why this is kind of substantial, not that the Open Streets project isn't already, but the reason why this is kind of substantial is uh, they have a significant install base, and they're enabling, they're going to enable this functionality on current devices. They just need a firmware update, so they're already out there in hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Oh, I dig it. Uh, One of the other things they're going to be working on, which I'm just kind of getting the bare details on here, but they're working on a system where they'll be able to uh, use an FM broadcast method to anonymously have TomToms check in at different points of their location. So basically it'll be, hi, I'm a TomTom. This is my GPS coordinates. So yes, I'm on, you know, I'm on the freeway and I'm going this speed essentially. And I've been able to calculate that speed by tracking with the uh, satellite in space. And then it'll send that up to TomTom's w- servers. And then TomTom's going to be able to have live on the fly updated user generated traffic reports based on what other TomToms in your area are reporting. I think you just described a Will Smith movie. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I saw that one. Uh, there were satellites, and it was tracking them all over the place. And you the know, camera was zooming from the satellite all the way down to Will Google Smith Maps, and back and uh, Google forth. Maps on the iPhone does this now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting more and more common. It's but crazy. The uh, thing Google Maps. I love it. Kind of freaks me out at the exact same time. It's supposed to be anonymous. Uh huh. I know. Yeah. All right, Brian. The next story on the news docket for this week is decidedly non-hardware. Gadget. No, it's not. There's no way this can be non-hardware related. You love the hardware. I'm telling you, man. I'll, you, you ready? I'm ready. You sure? Give it to All me. All right. So a new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux is out. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5.4. But I thought I would speak specifically about something. Yeah. What is what is it? Interest. What does it give us? What does it give us here? What do we Lots got? Lots of stuff, Brian. And you know, if you're curious, you already you already know. Yeah, where to I find already know. That but give me the big stuff. Give me give me the big one. The big thing. Red Hat Enterprise 5.4 marks Red Hat's essentially completed transition to using KVM virtualizer instead of Zen. Now, the reason why I find this particularly interesting is Zen was really kind of where Red Hat stacked its cards for a little while. Oh, yeah. So you had a version of Red Hat Linux come out, and it was Zen, 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 Zen. It was. And then they had some 
kind of feedback from the different system administrators. People didn't like that it was outside the kernel. You had to reboot and boot a oh, Zen specific kernel. No. And then KVM came along and it's integrated directly into the mainline Linux kernel and it's got some pretty good performance. And yeah. then Citrix bought Zen and Citrix has a close relationship with Microsoft and Red Hat didn't what like that. What a tangled web. So Red Hat started to actually do a, a, a pretty good move from Zen to KVM. They they came out with one of the releases of Red Hat Enterprise Linux was a pretty good transition spot where you could choose to run either one. You could have a Zen system and then install KVM and bring up your systems. And they, they even brought a converter to bring your machines in. They did a pretty That's good nice. job. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. And now they're shipping. Now they're really now they're putting their weight behind KVM. And and KVM is a pretty great uh, virtualization technology. The, the downside I think for Red Hat that they're going to have here is, is this based on Fedora. There's gonna be, there's gonna be some catch up time. Zinger. Yeah, people in the enterprise that have the enterprise servers, they do not like this kind of infrastructure level change. They don't mind infrastructure well, improvements. Dude, yeah, but, but this is a major change where basically they're gonna. And it, here's the thing that bothers me about this. So if you were using it and you were using it for Zen and you or you were heavily relying on Zen, this isn't even like a full version upgrade. This isn't like a version 6.0 or tech. 10.0 or X or right, something right. like that. It's 5.4. You would yeah. expect 5.4 to be bug fixes. Well, maybe see, a few additional. They're small not taking tools. Zen out. Zen is still in there. Zen is not out until Red Hat six. What Red, I think what Red Hat's trying mm. to do is, is give it is give it like a phase out time. Yeah, they're trying to give people stepping stones to migrate off Zen. But the thing is, that is, just seems like the wrong way to go, though. Well, the wrong way to go was choosing Zen originally. The wrong way to go was choosing Zen, but I don't know. It just honestly, at this point, it seems like the wrong way to go was choosing Red Hat Enterprise. I mean, it, it seems like okay, okay, and and this is this is horrible. Well, but, I mean, but, it's the big so dog. Let's, so let's say let's say you have a bunch of options out in front of you. You could choose, you know, to run like a Debian stable system yeah. or CentOS, sure, or a, or CentOS or, a, is basically Red or, Hat or you could or you could run like FreeBSD that's all locked down. Yeah, you could. Or you could get a Windows server. There's lots and lots of options. Right. So if you run any of the free options, like let's say you get stable, stable Debian, right? You can do whatever you want and you can just stick to it. Yeah. No big deal. No big deal at all. Now, let's say, but let's say you want to pay and you want to get the support. Really? The two big options are you go Windows or you go Red Hat Enterprise. Really? Or, I mean, sl- or SUS or, Enterprise or Linux. Or SLES, or SUS Linux Enterprise Server, which honestly keeps it more stable than Red Hat does. So um, but so let's say, but but in most people's minds, SUS Linux Enterprise is a newer guy to the to the game than uh, than uh, Red Hat, right? Well, yeah, and I mean, well, it Novell totally has is. the long history of network. I mean, it, so they've that got gives them some in, but, but Red Hat kind of established but itself got as that. this market leader. What I'm saying here and they is, clearly are. if you want to, if you wanted to go for a particular solution, if you went for the Windows route or the SUSE Linux route, you'd have a pretty consistent, stable solution that you were paying for. For Red Hat, you're paying to not have a consistent solution. Well, it just seems really stupid. I, to me. I do agree that it's a pretty big change. The, the one thing that's it's nice about dumb. Red Hat is depending on the on the Red Hat Enterprise subscription that you have, you can continue to run the older version for a very long time. Like I think it's almost like ten years. Almost for sure. You can run the older version for a heck of a long time. Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying that that just it just seems like, but what that mean, but that means is they're ensuring that people are going to at least consider moving somewhere. Well, else. what I would have liked to have it's, seen, it's just not a good move. Is I would have liked to have seen kind of a public um, roadmap and plan. So I think, I mean, I think there must have been a point in Red Hat's, um, you know, meetings and yeah. things like that where they said, you know what, they must have said at some point internally, you know what, we're going to migrate away from Zen. And then what they should have done is put out a public uh, roadmap so that way system administrators could begin to plan for that because. If uh, you know, if you're one of the people that um, God, I'm the, the the name of the company is uh, escaping me, but Red Hat put out a big press release about a company that migrated 300 systems into Zen Virtualizer. Sure. Now they have 300 servers that they need to make a profit because it runs right. all of their systems in Zen, and they can't and be they're using at, future Red Hat products. Well, what they'll have to do is go through that migration process for 300 systems, 300 critical systems. I mean, going on track record, though, there is no way I would trust that the, the migration process would work. And that to me is, I mean, it's like... It's well, like, the one and, nice thing I suppose is stupid. the nice thing that uh, they're doing this phase migration is it's eh. because it's because it's been working, been, they've been working on it for so long, hopefully they have that process ironed out. You know what I like? Hmm. I like companies who have foresight and uh, pick good solutions and do a good job. Well, and that's what I was saying. I mean, I think if they would have put out a roadmap... Basically anyone but Red Hat at this point. It's getting really uh, ridiculous. It was pointed out in the chat room. I didn't, I didn't, catch, I didn't catch who mentioned it, but if you recall, uh, Alan Cox... Oh, I recall all too le- well. Did he leave? He left... Did he leave Red Hat or did he just leave kernel development? Um, 
either way uh, i believe alan cox left red hat e- yeah i think so either way uh it's interesting that perhaps the two are related I, I throw that know. out there. I, it maybe it, it could be. I'm just I'm just saying. You know what? I'm just I'm just not a fan of every time Red Hat comes out and does something new. Every time the Fedora project does something new, I look at it and go, "Really? <clears throat> you kind of kind of screwed up a oh, little yeah, bit there, Al- didn't you?" Uh, Serge is saying uh, that, uh, or Sergey is saying it, that Alan Cox now works for Intel. And you know, honestly, that probably makes a lot more sense. Uh, you know, I I have a lot of hopes because in the old days, I mean, Red Hat was well, the here's man. The thing. You got to think and of it this were, way. They were the man to beat, and they were always doing a great job. And, I, and it's just like, well, what I know are you're not. A, I know you're not a Fedora fan, but and it, I used to. You be. look at it I used this to be way. a huge Fedora fanboy. If you if you consider that Fedora uh, generally is, um, they hate it when we say this, but it's essentially. A stagenary for Red Hat Enterprise, the best of Fedora that gets ironed yeah. out gets way, make makes its way into Red Hat Enterprise. And if I'm a system administrator, I mean, I did this while I worked for a place that ran Red Hat Enterprise. As I ran Fedora on my desktop, that gives me time there to kind of um, see where the direction of the product is going and and prepare for that. Because if I'm running Fedora yeah. and Fedora 11 has what Red Hat Enterprise. 5.6 is going to have a year from now, then I can kind of prep myself that way. So that's, it's a kind of a unique um, position that Red Hat is in over, say, something like Microsoft because Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 are not really that much different of a beast. You can't load Windows 7 and say, okay, I know what Microsoft's going to do in a year from now. You don't have that kind of flexibility because they both come out around the same time. They're both kind of based off the same thing. Now, the one, mm-hmm. the one nod I'll give to Microsoft, though, is Microsoft over communicates. Microsoft right. will have documentation for the next five years of what they're going to do. Uh, now, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes they change it on you and you're like, damn it, Microsoft, you're screwing me in the A. But they try. And yeah. I think I'd like to see Red Hat start doing that more. They do it to an extent. They do have do- they do do it. But they need this would have been a great opportunity to really do that. Yeah, it would have. But you know, you know, they're they're quote unquote an open source company. So, of course, they wouldn't want to communicate. Well, with anybody, the communication ever. was done through the Fedora product itself by watching. Uh, where that was going. That's lame. It's not. It's not that's ideal. Totally, hundred percent lame. It's not ideal. The people that have massive infrastructures in there, they're not totally happy about it. Yeah, it's lame. All right, that's all I got. Is is that what you got? That's because because I, I, I agree. Fedora's lame. Uh, I'm is, not that, is that what the news story was? No, no. That I was, think the news story was that Fedora's lame. You are an angry person. Just with just when it comes to Fedora, I actually have to get all my anger out because when we start talking about haiku, uh, the gushing fanboy is going to be unleashed. <laughs> all right, Brian. Well, let's get to that. So I, I I just just wanted to give you up the end of Red Hat Enterprise, Brian. But apparently you didn't want to hear it. Hey, Chris, is that all the news for this week, Brian? That's all the news for this week. All right. It's haiku time. All right. And f- before we get into this too much further, I want to kind of give a little background Do you want to just apologize up front? Uh, no, I want to... Uh, because <laughs> you're about to freak out. I'm going to freak out a little bit here. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about what haiku is and where it came from. Just very briefly. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, haiku is an open source operating system that is um, not based on, but derived from the ashes of BIOS. Um, now, BIOS, of course. So there's is wait, before you go too far. When you when you say not based on, you mean there's no original BIOS code in this? Uh, not anymore. What, son? You're kidding me. No. So so basically, what Haiku, what they've done with Haiku, is they've gone through and systematically replaced all the various pieces and parts of BIOS with open source versions. Shut up. Yep. Wait a minute. So, so you're telling me I'm not I'm not screwing with you on this. No wonder it's taking them so long. <laughs> and here's the thing. And they did it right. So let's 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 back up a second though here. What is BIOS? And um, if for those of you who aren't aware, maybe you're a little too young. Maybe maybe you're just weren't nerdy at that particular point in time. All is forgiven. Let's talk about BIOS for a second. BIOS was started back in the early 90s. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They, they created this machine called the B-Box. Yeah. Uh, it was a cool little herd-based Power machine. Power right? Uh, which had, no, not originally. Um, AT&T, um, oh. um, what's, whatchamacallit, uh, based processors, the Hobbit, the old Hobbit processors. Oh, wow. Uh, which was, a, they had a little multi-processor system, and they created this OS that sat on top of it. 
Um, and then they quickly moved that operating system to PowerPC, and they had that operating system running on early PowerPC Max. Um, so you could get like the old 603E yep. Yep. Uh, Power Max with two processors, and you could run BIOS on it. Yeah. Very cool. In fact, um, back uh, before Steve Jobs returned to Apple, um, Gil Emilio was running the shop at Apple. Back when Mr. Jobs was still at <coughs> Next. And interestingly, also, Gil Emilio was the guy who brought us things like oh, I don't know, the iMac and returned Apple to profitability. But then, you know, whatever. Steve Jobs got all the credit. No big deal. Anyway, I'm sure Gil Emilio is not bitter at all. Um, but there or was, Brian. There was two options here for the next generation operating system for Mac OS. Because Mac OS at the time was the old OS 8. Yeah. You're talking it about was, Apple management was saying, okay, we've, we, we've got to do something. Had, they've had, they had projects at Apple to come up with a new OS for quite some time. Uh, there, were, there were many. Oh, Rhapsody is OS 10. Um, uh, what was the project I'm thinking of? <laughs> Copeland? Yeah. All right. So that we'll get into. We can talk about that at a later time. Um, but uh, there was two main options. Basically, when they they all their projects in house had failed, they looked outside. And they looked at two companies. One was Next, which was headed by Steve Jobs, and that's what won and became OS X and everything. Right. Uh, and the other was BIOS, headed by a guy named uh, Jean-Louis Gasset, who was uh, originally like the head of Apple France. Um, anyway, so he is the guy who started this company to create BIOS and, and the B hardware line. Okay. So they created this system. And... It's a very cool system. Uh, Jeremy, feel free to, to switch over for the video people uh, so you can see some of the screenshots. If you're listening to the audio version at home, uh, feel free to go check out um, some, some screenshots online. Just do a search for BIOS or Haiku. Or watch the video version. Or watch the video version of the show. And, and you can kind of see some of what it looks like. Um, so they created this OS. And here's the thing that was crazy about it. It was insanely multi-threaded. And... Of course, nowadays, multi-threading is common. You, of course, you want multi multiple threads per application. It just, it just helps things run faster. You can, you can do multiple things at once. And one of the big benefits a lot of people see is, well, if you have an application like, let's say, um, Firefox, great example, your web browser, you want your main window to be running in a thread and then a secondary thread to be doing, let's say, your rendering and sure. downloading of your content. Yeah. This means that your window and your application is still responsive while doing all the background tasks, like downloading uh, your software, your the files you're downloading online. Sure. Um, but they took it a step further in in with BIOS. They made pretty much everything its own thread. And I mean, we're talking like a button would be a thread. I'm now, only like I've heard a that that's button. actually too much. Like it was too complex. Uh, yeah. It was too much thread. Like you just like it was so much for a developer to wrap his head around. It's totally not. Um, right. That's just. You're a just saying you have to be a baller. You do, You know what? You really don't. It actually makes a great deal of sense. So they they focused on C plus plus as the main uh, programming language that, that you develop in for BIOS, yeah. and uh, it's just heavily multi threaded. Okay. And because of that, it takes advantage of multiple processors and multiple cores far Boy. better than any computer system I still have ever seen. Wouldn't it shine today? It does shine today. So then flash forward a little bit. Uh, and BIOS was, was not doing so great. Um, and it needed some help. It needed some love. Uh, so they tried things like making the B Internet appliance. Yep. So they did like web, web tablets before they were web tablets running running BIOS. And uh, they were trying to tout BIOS as a heavy multimedia machine because it was so fast and so multi-threaded. It was great for audio processing. Um, and then they moved mm -hmm. forward. So yeah. And then they went out of business, yada, yada, yada. They got bought by uh, Palm, Palm and nothing ever really happened. Nope. So but we haiku. did get WebOS 10 years later. Yay. Yeah, which has nothing to do with BIOS. Nope. Um, but people still love this system. It's beautiful. Um, the UI, it doesn't leave... It's not anything super fancy. I actually don't mind the UI. It's not very flashy. It's not very flashy. It's very simple. Um, and Haiku retains the UI from BIOS um, in that it has yellow tabs everywhere. Um, literally... Instead of the window title bar that we're so used to on every OS, it's, it's a, a tab. tab. Yeah, it's a tab. Um, that is yellow. Yep. And um, it kind of became synonymous. In fact, there was a company called Yellow Tab yeah. for a while that was trying to sell BIOS, and there was a legal brouhaha around it. Um, so, but anyway, so Haiku. Haiku started by a, by a bunch of guys. They're like, you know what? We want to take and make an open source version of BIOS, and we want to put it under a license that we like. Um, and they chose MIT. So okay. it's, it's an open source project all under the MIT license. Um, so do they have their hands on the original BIOS code in order to re-implement it? No. Jeez. How do they do it then? I don't understand. Because they're baller. 
Chris. Wow. That I is mean, the pure, that's the crazy pure fact baller. of the matter is these guys are baller to an extreme. That's crazy baller, right? And what a project. <laughs> Dude, what a project. So I wanted to, uh, the alpha version, this is the very first alpha. It's been in development for a while now. Quite a while, a couple years, um, and this is the first alpha wow, of, of the first release. This feels great for being an ever. Alpha. Um, and there are problems with it, but there are some great things about it. And the first alpha is supposed to come out this next week. So if you're watching this video uh, within a few days of it being released, uh, you'll have the alpha version, including live CDs, uh, VMware images, etc., will all be available uh, within a couple of days. Mm. Yeah, the, what I'm From, running right uh, here. From haiku-os.org, I'm by running the way, is the a, website. I'm running just a, a VMware image that you can just download. And, right, and of, the, of the pre-alpha. And, and it, to, be, if, to be fair, if you really want to see it shine, put it on a actual metal. Uh, run it yeah. on hardware. Uh, it, 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 it's okay to play with on VMware, uh, but to see it actually shining, even on my little netbook here, my little HP Mini 1000, holy lord, does it scream. Um, I mean, I've run every OS on here. I've run Ubuntu on here. I've run Windows 7 on here. I've run OS 10.5 on here. Nothing performs like Haiku does. Nothing. I mean, it is such a night and yeah. day difference. I remember speed wise, applications just s jump out at you what and launch. What was like one of the you. last releases? It was like BOS five R two. Yeah, something yeah, like that. yeah. BS R five. R five. I remember R five two. I put like it that. on a uh, like a like a mid range Intel box. Yeah, and. Um, Oh, my, my impression, I think it had like a 15, 20 second boot and it, it auto detected all yeah. of the hardware in that box for the first time during that. Yep. It was crazy fast. Crazy fast. Uh, I remember because back then it was a big deal if you could play a video and do other stuff and not have the video skip. And that was never yeah. an issue in BIOS. Uh, so this Haiku um, operating system, uh, one of the first things that I remember from BIOS that now coming back looking at Haiku that jumps out at me is... This is such a weird thing to talk about, but the file system. It's gorgeous. The layout of the file system is right, let's, so uh, intuitive. It's simple. It's, it's the beautiful thing. It's better you, than you any go, operating system's you file go system up to the, it, It's almost like it took the best of the original Mac, OS X, and Linux, and combined just the good elements of all of them, combined them all together, and then gave us this. Yeah, and it's gorgeous. You go up to the root, and you've got your you've got your apps folder, your home folder, yep. a preferences folder, a system folder, and a, and a couple other fol folders that are that are optional. But all your folders are neatly and tidily yeah. organized in yeah. very simple, Having non convoluted way that people could easily understand. It's amazing. I mean, when's the last time I could have? Maybe last time I ran BIOS was 12, 13 years ago. And so I don't really remember anything as far as, as far as the file system goes. Jumping into this in the first five minutes, I knew uh, where everything was. Yeah. And and now is this the uh, is this the same crazy awesome BIOS file system that BIOS had back in the day, or is this? Yeah, a, this is the basic. Yeah, it's it's still the B file system, the BFS, the, the BFS, file which system, is a journaled file system. Uh, is basically something else that was supposed to be really great. About um, it, I forget. Though. It's just a great file system. It's a nice journaled file system, which is one of the first really big OSs like to adopt a nice journaled file system. I thought there was something very specific, like that to, we're just trying to accomplish today in today's file systems that they already had back then. And I th thought maybe it was making it not screw up all the time. <laughs> I don't know. That's a big <laughs> maybe one. That, maybe that was it. Here, here's the thing. Uh, every time OS 10, a new version ships, you hear horror stories about people losing data on HFS drives. Every time a new version of Windows comes out, especially on the server, you hear about NTFS drives going going tits up. Uh, you know, like uh, extended file system EXT4, you hear awful sorts of problems. When was the last time you ever heard someone say, oh man, BFS just ate everything? Well, they don't, you know. But it, it didn't happen back in the day. doesn't happen now. now that, that's all I'm saying. I'm in the shell. What kind of shell is this? I mean, is it a, is it a specific type of Unix um, shell? Or? Yeah, no, it's a POSIX compliant shell. I believe it's just a tush. Hmm. Yeah, is what it is currently. Yes. So, so if you're coming from the Linux world, you're going to feel very at home. Let's back up a second. All right. Let's start from the beginning. Do it. Let's say you go grab the live CD of this. Okay. The live CD is just like a Linux live CD. It lets you hop right into the uh, the OS itself and play around with it. Sure. Uh, I so mean, it's, it's great. One of the things I remember it was very good. I was auto detecting hardware. It so. auto detected all your hardware and, and it boots crazy fast, just like BIOS of olden days. The installer, the installer is the best installer I have ever seen really? for an operating system. There is almost nothing to it. <laughs> It, it's deceptively simple. Huh. You get to it, it literally presents you with a window and says, this is your installer. Nice. And you're like, okay. And it tells you, hey, 
I don't see anything I can install BIOS on or Haiku. Sorry, Haiku on. Uh, you should uh, you should launch the little Drive app and uh, do a partition. And, and would do you? a partition thing. Hey, would you do and, a partition? Oh, it's right there with one click. Pop pop it open. Their Drive their Drive partitioning thing lets you format drives in HFS plus NTFS. Every, uh, Fat32, <laughs> BFS, uh, Extended 4, X, EXT3. It has basically a list of like 10 or 12 different formats I can choose from. It's all phenomenal. This and it does cool. it very, Let's very fast. Check this out, Brian. All right. So right now I've got, um, I've got Bon Echo, which is the current like next generation development version of Firefox, the chat room tells me. Yep. I've got Bon Echo running plus one, two, three four other programs yeah, quite and the operating system and I have four virtual desktops going. And this is, this is in VMware with one processor on kind yeah. of an older machine. But I'm only using 158 megabytes of memory for yeah. the entire system. Right. For everything. That's, that's, I mean, I know. That's less than 256 megs of RAM. <laughs> Seriously. It's ridiculous. <laughs> that's with, that's with, you know, it's real today. Ridiculous. That's with a media player running, a web browser going, four four desk space, uh, a couple of different uh, file browsers. I mean, this is really nice. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. So, what's the so, practical pr- use of this, though? Because unfortunately, I mean, it might be one of those cases where where the the very very um, advanced system just didn't win out. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is. In my opinion, um, it is one of the coolest operating systems there is still currently um but if we don't have the software what does it matter right yeah i mean i mean if i can't use it for things i mean i see they have some apps in here they mean they they have well they have a lot of apps in there um and there are a lot of app more apps you can go get um so you can use it for a day-to-day machine honestly if you were to use this for a netbook os it would work incredibly well um, with one caveat. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking uh, this would run great on my triple. There's currently no Wi-Fi that's working. Uh, yes. So there are experimental Wi-Fi stacks work going on right now, um, but uh, there is currently no functional Wi-Fi in Haiku. Yes, the teapot exists still. The, oh, the of GL course. Teapot. Yeah, yeah. Getting a thousand frames per second in VMware. In <laughs> VMware. <laughs> In VMware, we're getting a thousand frames per second in in, in a VMware with no virtu- with no 3D acceleration. None at all. Um, it, it, and seriously, it screams crazy fast on my netbook. Yeah. Insane, oh, I bet. Uh, and by the way, it sees both cores, and it actually it, it has a little pulse application that has a little. I don't know if you can see it in the video shots there, but it actually says you know Intel Core. Yeah, you know processor. I remember they had that back in the Dizzle too. That it actually shows you what type of processor it is, and has a little graphic of it. Yeah, it actually shows me that this the one I have in here is the Atom two seventy processor. It knows it what it is. That? They're amazing. They I'm telling amazing. you, the guy making the guys making this are baller. Um, now. As it's it's a generally no three D drivers system. either, right? Uh, no, there are there are, well there are accelerated drivers, but and there is there is OpenGL stuff. Yeah, gotcha. uh, just no Wi Fi. The really killer right now is the lack of Wi Fi. If I had Wi Fi, I would for sure without any hesitation at all throw this alpha release on my netbook and run it as my well, main and netbook especially, system. Especially, I mean, so much stuff now is web based. I mean, you're you're fine. You're you know what? You know go. what is kind of blowing my mind, and this, people in the chat room were talking about this, and and the idea of a f- of a of an operating system is so phenomenally fast that it feels like there's absolutely zero load time for this anything. Is, this is the thing, but it's so now, fast. Picture that running on an SSD. I know. <laughs> I know. That'd be cr- you'd, you'd probably just burn I a hole through know. the universe. And and again, how much how much memory are we using there? A hundred megs or so. Yep. And uh, in a standard netbook right now, I got two gigs. Yeah, yeah. Come on. So now it's uh, now Jeremy is asking. So if it's under the MIT license, is there any is there any reason why somebody couldn't just contribute the code for Wi-Fi drivers? No, and people are that that that's the thing is there are so there are projects. Worked on. And in fact, if you've I mean, got this, could be a crazy great netbook. If OS. you've got certain um, you know Wi-Fi chipsets, if you go and look on Haiku uh, OS dot org and look around there, there are projects oh. you can download to get get Wi-Fi kind of working. Oh, so however, mean, it is very experimental. Oh, okay. it is very early, and uh, uh, no guarantees that you'll get it to work even after mucking with it for quite. It's some just time. so there are some. That are available. Today. There are, there are, and it is coming. Um, wh- what they need to do now is they need to get some more drivers in place, and they need to get their finalized UI for uh, configuring Wi-Fi. Uh, they don't oh, have that in the gotcha. system currently. Right, right. Because hmm. that that is really their. their I don't understand last thing. how they're able to reimplement stuff uh, at the same level. I mean, there must be there must be incompatibilities. Oh yeah. Hey, oh, ha- have a really good time. Load up the fonts there. There must be incompatibilities. Um, so here's here's the great thing about this. So. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Is this the uh, the font preview or is it under demo? demo. Go, under, oh, go under demos gotcha. and yep. there's a font, font thing in there. Font demo. Yep. Yeah, there's a <laughs> font demo in there. Okay, it's no big deal. Sure. Uh, go ahead and uh, and make the font larger. Um, just just make All it right. make it bigger. Here I go. All right, just uh, you know make it make it larger. Okay, now rotate it. Now rotate the font. I will rotate the font. There rotate I go. That I'm font. rotating the font. I, I I want make it make it even larger still. I would like you to notice wow. how intensely smooth everything is. Like the like oops, I clicked on the other. That's like the clearest best looking font I've ever seen. I know. And that that's how and that's how the rendering is inside all of Haiku. Everything is anti-alias to the extreme. Wow. Everything is well done. Everything is gorgeous. It, it, in the video it might look a little jaggedy, honest, but that's because of the video rendering. Honestly, oh, yeah, it does not right. look jaggedy at all. There is no jaggedy. Wow. Um, Haiku is I'm doing other stuff, so <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it is, is amazing. absolutely an amazing system uh, from top to bottom. I <sighs> I don't know why, but whatever reason, that font stuff is impressing the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that looks amazing. It's just like fonts. That. And here's the thing. Uh, you know, like Windows 7, OS 10. Crystal uh, clear, Linux, Linux. Perfect. I mean, they've all got great font systems. They all really do at this point, but not like BIOS does. I don't understand how BIOS had all this stuff so right, and we still don't have this crap. I don't know. I think maybe maybe B, uh, the, maybe B Incorporated just did a bad job of, of, uh, of selling it. Maybe they just... Maybe they just kind of screwed the pooch themselves. Wow, even when I shear it to an angle, it doesn't, I know. it doesn't have it. And this is just fonts. And the reason I point this out to you is That's because amazing. every aspect of the system looks like this. As you are going through and modifying all of this, remember that everything is heavily multi-threaded. So if you've got videos playing elsewhere, yeah. and and they still have the demo in there somewhere where, where you can have like a 3D cube and the videos playing on each surface of the cube and all the other stuff. Every video is its own thread. All the 3D cube itself is its own thread. The rendering is its own thread. Those sliders are their own thread. It's gorgeous. So that means if something somewhere locks up and has a hard time, the system's fine. Wow. It's not just protected memory. It's not just really good multitasking. It's crazy pervasive multi-threading. And it's it's very well done. And now this, could is, a developer, this though, is something that's exciting. Could a developer be like a boner and just make everything a single thread? Uh, it'd be hard to do. Really? Yeah. Uh, the the way it's currently set up is there there it Haiku comes with its own uh, SDK um, and it okay. comes with the dev environment and as long as you follow, is it decent? It's very decent. <laughs> um, in fact, in the old days, um, it was actually old MetroWorks code. Oh, Warrior. Jeremy, put the put my screen back up. Yeah, for people watching the video version, it has a song cycle fonts mode, yeah. and I have it <laughs> I have it rotated at a slant, spaced out, and then sheared. And it's, it's man. Just, I, I wish the video weren't. Uh, the video weren't will grainy. show. Will show. Will show. Imagine some, it super smooth, <laughs> and just, that's what it's like. It's just, it seems like a dumb thing to get excited about, but I couldn't reproduce this at this level in any operating system we have. Today. It's it's absolutely it's absolutely phenomenal. So, so really, what, what I'm stopping here is that there are. I, I need to focus on the bad points because honestly, I could go on for years about its good points. It's just really good. And we are now using 160. Four megabytes of memory, <laughs> and it'll go back down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does a very good job of the memory management. Um, there is no built-in flash plugin for the browser that they currently have. Mm, uh, the browser yeah. well, itself, that's not their fault. The browser itself, uh, which is just like codenamed Bon Echo, uh, which, is, which the, is basically Firefox, which is very alpha version, but it's supposed to be like the next gen version of Firefox. Yep, yep. Um, that seems fancy. It is very fancy. It works well, um, but there are some rough edges. Um, but it's still very usable. As in, uh, honestly, like when I was using some of the beta versions of like Firefox three, this is more usable than this, that was. This has some really, but not in a bad way, simplistic things. Like, okay, so in one click, I'm able to get to my network settings. Yeah, which Microsoft, holy it Jesus! Like would you pay clicks. attention to that? Yeah, to get to my network adapter. Yeah, it's like it's like that is the five point. years later. I finally find the that network is settings. Absolutely, the point. Everything. One click. If you go, it's very uh, simple. Click, click on the uh, click on the haiku button up there, which is a, like a little leaf. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now now go back. Open up your preferences again. I will go um, my preferences. Jeremy your preferences Sheldon. are right there. It's it's very old school in that you you click on what your preferences yeah. and you just get a pop up yeah. menu yeah. of all so of it takes all your me different two system clicks preps. to get to the preferences menu for people in the audio version. Everything. Two clicks and and then, everything. and then everything's right here, and then I just click on anything inside here. Maybe yep. my, maybe I want to do my screen resolution, and it's so it's three clicks, and I'm adjusting my screen resolution. Now that's not unusual for GNOME, really. That's kind of what, no, about where no, GNOME's no, at. Yeah, a lot of, got a that. Lot of, I, you know, I think there must have been a lot of BIOS people that moved to GNOME, that you know, because but like KDE, right? KDE, you have to you have to really drill down. 
Yeah. And and windows, you really have to drill yeah, down. Yeah, and exactly. it's annoying. Yeah. And this is just so, it's just so nice. Everything is simple. The applications are right there. The file system is immediately uh, immediately accessible and readable and understandable. Yeah. Uh, it's, and you've got multiple workspaces. Um, it's, oh, man. One click. It's just one so nice. click. Oh my gosh, wow. Are you seeing that? That is so cool. So one click uh -huh. and I've got uh, a really quick drop out menu uh, task manager where I can kill any process. And it shows in a graphical way the memory usage of everything. And it doesn't take a while to load up. It's just boom, it's right there. Yeah. It's not a separate application yeah. you load. It's just boom, right there. And then, and then, and then I move down. There's all of the programs in the, in a, in a, in a menu list with on the right hand side a bar <laughs> of their memory usage, so I can yep. tell how much memory each different program is taking. Yep. And then, oh wow, oh wow. Uh -huh. Okay, so then the bottom menu here is okay so yeah wrap your head around okay, that one okay so this is every application <laughs> and in the right hand side it is the amount of cpu it's taking and then when you hover over that application you get the amount of cpu it's taking on a thread level uh -huh. i can see each now wait wow now drill down further holy crap oh what you can go i can go into the threads themselves no what? those uh-huh. Setting priority on a per thread basis inside applications. And I'm I, four clicks in. I'm four. I'm not even clicking. I I'm just hovering. I'm it, four hovers in. I kid you not. You can go into any application. Let's say you want to go into your web Holy browser. Holy sweet mother. And, this is amazing. And you want to set the priority of your of your, your Let's rendering. Do it. Okay, Let's so say you're up, rendering. I'll load up Bon Echo yep, here. Here we go. And uh, I'll go into that. Uh, they call it the Bzilla browser which which um, is funny that's yeah. that's classy guys you guys you guys over on the haiku team are keeping it classy all right so i'll go here um the um uh, so it's they have a little cpu usage thing up by the clock and if you click on that cpu usage thing by the clock it brings out this menu yep. system so i've opened up two web browser windows man you guys who aren't watching the video version are missing out right now I'll, you know <laughs> I'll what i'll do to, i'm trying to describe this as we I'll go link to, audio wise in the show notes i'll link to the specific time in the video all right where you now, now go to the threads and cpu usage. all right so i've got two browser windows open and i'll go to threads and cpu usage and then here's my bezilla browser yep and then, okay, so under Bezilla browser, I can see both windows. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. So these are these are each individual threads inside that window. Oh, yeah. Those are individual Mozilla threads. So those so, are threads as defined by the Mozilla project. Right, right. So here here I could say, okay, so here's this is the actual HTML window rendered here. Yeah. And I could say the win, the HTML rendering. You want rendering, the window to have high priority. I want the rendering engine to have high priority. Uh, you can give the little animation thing Notice, low I, priority. I want to I I I point something out here. What's the, the top one says idle, right? Of the priority yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. What's the bottom one say? Real time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. That's a big oh, deal. Yeah. So let's that's say, a, that's a, let's say, let's say, Chris, just on an example, we were editing audio and recording it live. I would, I would put that on real time, Brian. You sure as heck would. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. I think I've said that about 18 million times. This is so really, far. this is really, this is stuff that I want to see in today's operating systems really bad. Chris, this is today's operating system. Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's not the main player and it's still alpha, but what this is accomplishing, how this is designed is light years huh. so ahead of what almost everyone else is doing. This, uh, this haiku menu button, which is, equivalent to say your no menu or, or your, your start, start menu button, it's yeah. a precursor to those really but uh yeah it really is this is it basically it used, it used to just say b up there hold but now, on a it's a, now it's a leaf so this was developed this this button this menu system was implemented before there ever was a start menu before there ever was a no menu. um yes right yes and it does so much more than any of those things do today so much more. okay so yep. i click on the i click on the feather which in haiku is that button mm -hmm. inside there I've got, of course, I've got all my applications, my preferences, things like that. Yeah, and you can organize them however you want. I've also got built-in search. Sure, great. But I can mount my different devices right from this menu in... And modify your mount point settings. In a single click. Yep. From this menu right here. Why can't I do that today? Now, click, now check that out. Automatic dismounting settings. Don't mount all BIOS. So all, any distance in the BIOS format automatically mount. Or, or just mount, everything. Mount everything. And when it says everything, BIOS can mount everything. And then I can say only only the... You know, how, you know how when you're on Windows, you can't mount like an EXT4 or or an HFS Plus? Or how you're when you're on a Mac, it, it just has problems, well, with everything. Um, 
<laughs> uh, or or when you're on Linux and you know you can kind of get NTFS working, but not HFS. You always, and, you always kind of uh, cross your fingers. Though. You cross your fingers. Uh, yeah, B mounts everything. Yeah, I remembered that from back then too. I this is this for whatever reason the fonts and the menu system um, are what's getting me going. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. So it's a great system. Um, out of the box, the the live CD alpha install gives you enough to to really to run your full like netbook based thing. If you if you are looking for a system to do all your email, your instant messaging, your yeah. web browsing, all of that, it's got that out of the box. What you don't have is flash and and Wi-Fi. Those are the two things you don't have. Yeah. Everything else is available to you. Now, of course, uh, you're not going to be able to go out and run Doom 3 and whatnot, but there are a lot of older open source games, of course, already ported over, uh, you know, like like uh, uh, you know, like 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 the original Doom or Quake. Oh, I want to run this operating system so so bad right uh, now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of. I I am waiting incredibly anxiously for when they have Wi-Fi support for my little I netbook can't because I guarantee you it will be my primary system. They had it in the. Is this new to Haiku or did in the nineties? Did they have multiple virtual desktops? Uh, they've had that the whole time forever. So uh, they had. So per, they've had, they call it workspaces, but it's basically virtual per, desktops. So you can have per workspace configurations. Right. This is this is really really nice. I mean, it's essentially what I can accomplish now under KD or GNOME, but sure, sure. I mean, I'm just, this feels like if somebody, if this feels like if somebody looked at all of the today's operating systems and said, you know, what would be cool is if I took this, this and this, and I'm going to make this OS only this OS was made before all of those. So I don't understand. I'm freaking out here a little bit because this feels like, like where everything we have today should get to. And it's, yeah. but <laughs> it was already there a long time ago. Hey, now, now here's here's an interesting little tidbit. You know, here we brought up a little 3D demo. Okay. Uh, of course, this is in VMware, so there is no 3D support. It's all software rendered. Now, go to your go to your thread manager. All right, I'll go to my thread manager by clicking on the little CPU usage yep. thing. Yeah, eh? click click on that little CPU usage thing. Okay. Uh, bring up your threads. Right. Uh, go to the Haiku 3D Haiku application. 3D. All right, here I go. Uh, notice uh, how many threads you've got going. All right, so I got one app, and for one app, I've got. Four threads. Four different threads. Now there's one render thread. Yeah. Go to your render thread. And what's neat is it's not just it doesn't just list that there's a render thread. It's listing how much CPU usage that individual that thread is taking. Individual threads taking. Yeah. Now crank that to real time priority. Now is that gonna hork me? Nah. Okay, now it's at real time priority. It sure as heck is. Now maximize that. Sucker. Oh, you know what? It's actually noticeably it's a heck running of better. a lot smoother. Of it course is. it is. Because you just said I want much more of my processor time to be dedicated to this process of this application. Huh. Now that's interesting because this is what I'm saying. That's actually that actually runs pretty good under VM. I was actually worried I would tank my VM session and that's nope. actually doing pretty good. Of course not. It's haiku. Therefore it's awesome. Um, uh, you know it's going to be a while before we hit a point with this project where I could say recommend this to most people. Um, in fact, this is it's going to be a while before this becomes my primary desktop at home because I like, to play, I like to play video games. Uh, yeah, I have to develop I software for yeah, a living, same. which means I've got to run you know, VMware support, and, yeah. and all this and that. Um, but as a netbook system, I can't... And we've reviewed a lot of netbook systems. We've reviewed Moblin. Uh, we've talked about a bunch of netbook remakes. Jolly uh, Cloud, Jolly Cloud which is really cool. Gas. But to be honest, nothing. I mean, they were all kind of sluggish. Yeah. Here's the thing. Yeah. They were all a little pokey. Yeah. This system running on my netbook is significantly faster than Ubuntu running on my 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 yeah, core you know, two three gigahertz system at home. And and that seems ridiculous to me, but that's just the way it is. So if you want a desktop class feeling thing, if you want to feel like you really significantly upgraded your lower end hardware or your netbook. <laughs> Linux is great. I love this operating system. But Haiku system. blows it out of the water in terms of raw speed, stability, and as odd as it sounds, customizability and you know, flexibility. You know what would be great? And that just, it almost drives me crazy that it's so good. Oh, it, it's, this is it's, cool. it's, uh, it's unreal. Oh, this is so... You know what would be great? There, now, there are audio editing applications available. I'm, um, looking, at a, I'm looking at a kind of like a built-in... Um, audio patch board application. Yeah. Uh, you know what would be really cool is... Uh, if if VirtualBox or somebody would come along and get support for Haiku as the host, I just want to I want to point out that yes, it does uh, it does have many many Ethernet drivers and it does have networking support. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that that works totally fine right now. I would love to use this as my host operating system because if you could take like oh, VirtualBox yeah. and get some of that multi-thread support going on, get that nice stable base, super fast, dude. Could you imagine? Uh, honestly, if it doesn't ma even matter to me if you know VirtualBox or VMware or one of those great virtualization solutions came out for Haiku. I would oh, yeah. go 
insane. Dude, if you had this, so I'd have like one workspace. It's like my all my web 2.0 stuff, and then another workspace would yep. be like a full time running Linux box, and then another workspace a full time Windows box. I mean, this would be, this would be just oh so nice, so nice. So you know that's that, that's kind of all I really wanted to point out about this. Again, haiku dash os dot org. That's that's the uh, that's the website. Um, they are. Uh, if you go there now, uh, their website is in a quote unquote freeze where they're getting ready for the big alpha. This is their big moment in the sun. Um, this is the first time they're really saying, okay, the public can take a look and kick the tires of Haiku. You Up know, until now, it's just been for true hardcore nerds who want to download and, and compile it themselves and things like that. I think you just found the, um, I know it doesn't have Wi-Fi support. But, but when it does, I want no, no. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to load it on my AAA PC. I want, I want to play with this so bad. I'm going to go Ethernet. Why not? This is so awesome that I just I have to be using this. You have to be using it now. And if and if you look through the forums and if you look around online, you'll hear of people using uh, their their triplees like the 900s and the 701s as their primary haiku box. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. It's really fast, I mean, even is, on those machines. Oh, I can't wait. I know, I know. It's it blows me away. It blows me away. And, and I would just like to say, um, this right here is one of the reasons I'm glad we're doing the computer action show um, because, you know, this isn't Linux, um, but it's so amazing. It has to be talked about and people aren't talking yeah, about and it. Yeah, one of the questions that's come up in our JupiterColony.com forum is uh, y there were some questions uh, if, uh, if uh, Haiku was uh, video, if it's... Um Graphics subsystem was based on XORG, but there's no. just there's zero GPL this code. Is in this is not Linux. It's not GPL. It's MIT, and it's totally new. It's so it's open it's source from it's scratch. MIT, it's fully open source. It's from scratch. Um, it's but it's not Linux. It's okay. uh, not BSD. It is, however, POSIX compliant. I cannot believe this is from which scratch. means this just seems which amazing. means uh, porting Linux and uh, BSD applications over to Haiku is not that that difficult. It's going to be much easier than, say, doing it on, on Windows or something like that. I'm going to have a hard time doing the rest of the show. I'm going to want to play with this. I know it, dude. I know it, dude. It's phenomenal. Wow. Wow. I highly recommend. If you are very nerdy, um, grab, grab the VMware image and toy with it, but remember that it runs at about a billionth of the speed on VMware as it does on native hardware. Try out the live CD, even if you just don't install it, even if you just run off of it. It is phenomenal. I wonder... I, I got to give huge, huge kudos. And if you've been watching any of the shows for the last year, uh, you'll notice that my kudos are reserved. <laughs> um, uh, because honestly, lately, over the last year, over the last two years, I felt like we've kind of stagnated. You know, like uh, Compass and Barrel on the Linux side. Those are very cool. Those give us great 3D effects and really push the limits. Um, Honestly, Chrome is a good browser. Google did a good job there. There have been a couple of key points. Oh, and I love Mamo and the new N900. Those look really great. But for so many OSs, for, for new distros coming out, they just aren't that great. They're, they're cool. They're like it was a year ago, only slightly better. And that's great. But this... This is this is just an open source BIOS. It's an open source version of an OS that was out over a decade ago, and it blows the barn doors off of Windows 7, off of OS 10.6, off of Ubuntu 9.10. It just blows them all away. The Bbit website's still around. I used to go to that place to get all my software. And, the, and, and you'll notice there's a haiku section in there, and the uh, software works, and there's drivers available for there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bbits, uh, b e b i t s dot com. Yeah. Um, and you know what? You know what they say. <laughs> and there's emulators and games and all. Download the zip stuff. file and extract it in the apps folder, and it's installed. Right. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. This is what I'm saying. The best parts about all the systems smashed together, and clean and beautiful. Hmm. I. I am so excited. So, so another big question that comes up is, what's the roadmap for this like? Um, what's what's the release schedule like? Um, when can we expect the final not alpha version? Uh, we can't. <laughs> the 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 Haiku project yeah, is mean, very very clear that um, they kind of took an old school Debian approach to this, where they're saying, you know what, guys, screw off. It's done when it's done. Yeah. And when we get it done, you guys will love it. Haikuware.com is another place to get. Uh, and they have a bounty there. If you actually if you go to Haikuware.com, uh, they have a bounty yeah. up top for Wi-Fi. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's because that's the number one well, thing everyone wants. Yep. Um, well, that's a so, great way to do it. That's a great way because.